Yeah, I saw your bike out there. That was really serious stuff. It's not like... Yeah. Um, how long have you had that bike for? Five months. Five months? Not that long. Yeah. yeah. No problems when you're, when you're riding at all? No. No, nothing. Like, you mean near death? Yeah, like, do you ever have the habit now of, like, the temptation to ride on the sidewalk and stuff? Oh, of course. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm the worst. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Those drivers, like, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm completely turned into a Korean driver. Well, what is what is the mentality behind that? Because I don't, I, don't, I don't ride a bike, so yeah. then... The mentality is just get to your destination as quick as you can. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's as simple as it gets. Yeah. Yeah, just get, get to your destination. It's nice, because, um, like, I was late here, and it, it, t- it took me, like, 10 minutes to get all the way from Ikeon to, to here. Are you allowed to, to go on the highway with your bike? No, you're not. So, what, so everything that you do, you just have to go through the basic city and then yeah. run away? Yeah, yeah. Mm. And, but there's always, there's always other roads. I, I even went down to Gwangju, Jeollado Gwangju, on my bike yeah. um, two months ago. And it's cool. Like, you just, there's other freeways. It's not as fast, but you can always get where you need to go. Mm-hmm. So you can always just take the scenic route and just go as far as you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Damn. Okay. Well, we, we're we on. We're on live. All right, cool. Cool. So, Hi. yeah, no one can see us yet, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, we just, right this is just pre-prep talk. We just got that thing going on over there. Okay. Uh, yeah, so um, let's just get everything started. Okay. here what's up everyone to the artist journey i'm your host Wilfred lee and today we're here with a very special guest mr dustin cole hey how's it going good how you doing hello internet people yeah so we're here today uh we're just doing a little bit of talking before so um before we start let's just get to some questions about what you do um so dustin where are you originally from san diego san diego yeah uh pretty much raised my whole life in san diego and then i went to college in san diego so i was there for 22 years or so. 22 years. And then when did you start coming into Korea? Uh, After San Diego, I moved to LA and Berkeley for about six months each. And then I came to Korea almost exactly three years ago. Three years ago? Yeah. So now it's been a good solid three years now that you've been here. Mm -hmm. Uh, What was your first experience like on your first year? Like, can you remember like your first month? Because every time as a foreigner, when you come here, it's uh, completely different. You're always probably ordering kimbap and stuff. Yeah. Well, I'm half Korean, so I have a lot of Korean family here. So mm-hmm. um, when I came my first month, my mom came with me. Um, she was staying here for a while. And, um, you know, I have lots of aunts and uncles and cousins. So the transition is not so bad. And I've been here mm-hmm. um, maybe 10 times growing up. So I'm kind of used to Korean culture. But, yeah, it was definitely difficult when I was living by myself for the first time. Mm-hmm. That, was, that was tough because my Korean sucked also. Yeah. So, uh, how did you? Uh, st- how is your Korean now after three years? It's better. It is better, it's right? Better. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I studied at university too for about six months. Oh, did you? Yeah. So yeah. I got it's like survival Korean down. I actually had an interview all in Korean, like a couple of days ago. I didn't get the job, but <laughs> 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 I made it through the interview. It was a it was yeah. a feat for me. You know, what you should do next time is uh, when you have an interview like that, just start talking in a Korean, ac- speak English, but with a Korean accent. So they'll, they'll assume that, you, oh, you're amazing, but your English is pretty good, you know? <laughs> All right. I'll try that. I don't uh, speak uh, very much uh, yeah. English, <laughs> but uh, my Korean is uh, amazing. Yeah. That's such a, you know, that's kind of interesting, though, because uh, I have one friend. He's been here. I was talking to him yesterday. He was, he's been here in Korea for six years, and his, in, his Korean has not improved at all. Yeah. And, um, I know so many of those people. You can get for people who are living in Canada or in America or anywhere out of Korea, you can survive in Korea without any Korean, surprisingly, which is kind of interesting. It's a good thing and it's a bad thing, obviously. Yeah. Because there's like levels. There's levels. First level is probably how to order food. 
Second is like taxi cab driver conversations. Yeah. And then third is like uh, talking to other people beyond the taxi. And then I remember when I was young, I wanted to get to that point where I wanted to have meaningful conversations with people. Mm -hmm. You know, because you know, after a while, you just started having the same paths of of routes of like you know conversation. Hey, yeah. we do blah blah blah, and then. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. And then you can just speak those parts really well and easily. Yeah, like the getting to know you. But if you want to talk about anything substantial, yeah, any politics or religion or anything like out of the little initial, it's really mm -hmm. tough to make that next next step. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, Dustin, so now you're working as a full time photographer, right? Right. And how did you get into the transition? I mean, is that what you were doing originally when you first came here? Or? No, I came here to teach English initially. Mm. Um, I was doing some photography in the States, but um, I never felt like I was good enough mm. or I didn't have a good enough like portfolio to really do it full time. So yeah. I was doing other things and I've always been f doing photography ever since I graduated college. Mm. Um, so I did a couple weddings and engagements and stuff like that, but I started doing full time photography um, not too long ago. I, I did an MBA and then while I was in the MBA in here in Korea, I was doing some photography and when I graduated, I was looking for a job, but then I started getting a lot of photography gigs. So I was like, all right, well, I'll just do this mm. full time. This is great. Mm. And um, yeah, that only started about four, three, four months ago. Three, four months ago. And yeah. um, so you, you do a lot of uh, wedding photography and stuff and other events, but uh, something also spe special and specific that you do is a lot of, um, I guess, photography sessions of people during like the uh, adoption process. Right. So how did, how did that come? Because that's not something um, a lot of <clears throat> photographers I know at least that, um, they do that kind of uh, photography. Yeah, um, I don't, that was random. I was doing like mm. like engagements and other things, and then I got a, an email from a mom. She just asked me to take pictures during their adoption, and I knew my other photographer friend in Korea was doing some adoptions too, but I didn't really know how to get into that. Mm. But I got this this email, and then I did that first shoot, um, and it was great because that family was just gorgeous. Like the mom was really really cute. The daughter was. Awesome! It was a great. Turned out really great. Wow. And uh, after that, I think after I posted those photos, I got like five emails in a row. In my next two weeks, were like booked with adoptions, mm. and and then I've been getting steady adoption gigs ever since. So I was, just, I was just fortunate to get into that community. The moms are in these like Facebook groups. You know, the adopting moms. They're very. Oh wow. They're very like uh, into their adoption, or they're really excited because they've been waiting in this process for two years and thinking about Whoa. this child that they love. Yeah, it takes so long. And so they build up all this angst and uh, anxiety, not anxiety, but expectation, you know, for that. Why? Which creates some anxiety. And yeah, yeah, they're, yeah. yeah, they're very nervous. They can't, usually can't sleep the day before. And, and um, so they, they want pictures of that one hour where they finally get to meet their kid and, and um, ask all the questions and take them home. Wow. So, uh, so based on oh my god I didn't realize so the, the adoption process takes like is a two year process. Yeah, right? as I've been in this community, I've been learning about the adoption process. Right. And the Korean government has been keeps changing the laws and they're trying to promote domestic adoption. Mm -hmm. And so they've been, it's it's created the waiting period to be much longer. Mm -hmm. And uh, but Koreans don't domestically adopt, you know, mm -hmm. and they don't adopt boys for sure. Like they sometimes they adopt girls, but. There's almost there's very little domestic adoption, so there's a lot of Korean boys going overseas. So why why is that? Why is it more likely to have girls rather than boys? I I'm not sure. I think it's the Korean bloodline. Like they mm -hmm. want to give their name to um, a, a son that is their own, mm -hmm. um, or it's because Korean girls are cute. <laughs> I'm, actually, I'm not sure. I yeah. asked the adoption, uh, the social workers, yeah. and um, that the answer wasn't very clear, unfortunately. Yeah, I guess it's hard to be honest about that situation because, you know, I, I can only imagine, for example, uh, if you're in China, you know, like with the overpopulation over there, you know, I guess stuff that we probably learn in school is like, you know, sometimes it's, there's even laws against having a certain number of children, mm -hmm. you know, in, within your family, and if you do, you start have to pay a lot of, um, I guess, kind of, family fees and stuff and uh, there's a lot of abandoned children you know especially girls yeah due to um, it, the high need of um, men inside their family to get bet special ben benefits and yeah here it's a little bit the, the opposite it's also yeah I was really confused too because you know in yeah like in developing countries there's a lot of 
girls that are discarded, but they they or they keep having children until they get a boy. Wow, uh, it's because boys are tend to work and provide for the families when they're older. So mm-hmm. I thought that you would more want a boy than a girl, but also in Korea, I think boys are very expensive. You know, when you get married, the boys the guy's family is expected to pay for the apartment, mm-hmm. um, pay for a lot of things. So mm. I think it's more expensive for the parents to have a boy than a girl. So uh, usually is the people that you, photo- you photograph during the uh, adoption process, um, are the family members that are waiting for the new child, are they usually Korean themselves? Or are they more foreigner people? Or is it a mix of everyone? Or? Yeah, it's, it's a good mix. But the majority are not Korean Americans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I do all international couples that mm-hmm. come to Korea. Um, they're mostly Americans. I had one family from Luxembourg. Um, but I think I've only had one mother who was Korean American, and she was adopted, so she came back to adopt me for them, mm-hmm. which is really cool. So then, uh, once you started getting into this, um, you know, the the adoption community, how has this affected, you know, what you've been doing as a photographer, and just mm-hmm. how, you know, how you maybe maybe how you're living now in Korea. Well, first of all, it's allowed me to do it photography full time. That before that, I didn't have enough gigs to really right uh, do full time. So that's that's great. You know, mm-hmm. I really like doing photography full time. Um, it, it's also, yeah, it's, it's allowed me to not teach English, which is like the last thing I ever want to do ever again. Yeah, usually teaching English is kind of like a, like the initiation right that you have to do. It's like it's like a, every. Uh, foreigner that usually comes here, it's kind of uh, the ritual that you have to do as a first year. And then if you keep doing it, then that means, you know, either that's what you want to do or you haven't decided what you want to do yet. Yeah, it's kind of a transition, yeah. I think. Uh, but I, I don't know. I think I just don't like working with kids. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically, though. Ironically. Right? One at a time is fine. They're like two years old. They're cute. Um, it gets, I guess it depends on the age because, you know, like, I, I started to realize even for myself when I was teaching... Um, you find yourself being able to relate more to certain ages. Yeah. You know, usually with kids, either it's the easiest thing or it's like the hardest thing. Yeah. What age did you? I, I taught everything. I taught from like uh, age three to two to um, older people, like from age 60 and over. Yeah. Or whatever. What age but did you match with? What did you like the best? Um, I definitely meshed with uh, kindergartners and older people. I love talking with older people because, you know, the substance of the conversation can get more in depth and more deeper yeah. and stuff because you know, their priorities is much more different. They 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 want to learn yeah. rather than kids that just go there as part of their daily routine. Yeah. Um t- to be honest, it would it was the problem usually was where I was teaching. I would find that yeah, different right. districts would have different types of kids and their behavior and uh, mm-hmm. some kids were really nice, some kids were kind of brats and stuff based on, you know Yeah. I felt like they were kinda of spoiled in some way and some kids were just very humbled and, you know, and still respectful and stuff. So like it really depends on where I was teaching, but I, I really did enjoy teaching kindergartners. I remember like one of my wow. first years, um, I came to a school and they gave me a book and they said, "Okay, you have fifteen minutes, you know, teach these kids." Uh-huh. And then they gave me this big book that's only like three pages or mm-hmm. four, you know, like two sentences. Here is the dog, the dog going away, and then I read this in thirty seconds. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. so. Up, kids, <laughs> you know, and then they just start going crazy, and I'm like, oh no, what am I gonna do? Yeah, I hate that, but you like that? Uh, that was so my, that was my first experience, that's what it was like, and I'm like, oh, I'm never teaching kids because kindergarten yeah. is terrible, terrible. Yeah. But the thing is, I realized like that's my fault because I had no idea what I was doing, and then I would teach at other places, and I remember why one Korean teacher who taught English for the kids, mm-hmm. she was like a pro, and I, I saw her, she had like all these little. To me, it felt like gimmicks in a way, but there was yeah, actually sure. lessons. So it was like, hey, listen up. She had all these things to do. Yeah. And then I was like, I learned so much by um, working with her that I started making up my own system. <laughs> like I had a system of how to teach kindergartners. Mm-hmm. And, um, so, you know, they like like drawings and stuff on the board. So I would have like a, a star system. And then I say, you know, if you do really good, I'm going to draw like really big star. And then yeah. it's just like... Oh my God! This is amazing. <laughs> yeah, he's you so know? excited about the stars. Yeah. yeah, I remember teaching. Just started playing games with him, like um, musical chairs. Uh-huh. And that game, I, I, it was so funny because when you, I remember, I haven't remembered playing that game for the longest time. So when I played this game with these kids, mm-hmm. I could see how intense it was. Yeah. Because I'd have a piano nearby, and I just be like, dun dun 
and they just like and then they're screaming they're like screaming their ass off they're like oh my god and then you know everyone sits down I'm like all right sit down and then one kid gets out you're gonna have that one kid who's just like bawling because yeah. you know, this is so intense and yeah, yeah. i was like okay i'm gonna take one more chair out and everyone's like oh my god and then once it's like only two people left you're just doing the jaws thing over and over again and it's just so intense i love how there's always that kid that cries like what are they crying about but they're always crying for some reason yeah and then i don't yeah i just let them cry yeah it, the, the thing is you know it's like Every, everything obviously you know that everything is like a first time experience for them yeah. sure and I, I i forget that too sometimes because you know this is like the first time maybe something specifically happened to them in their entire life like this is a first time experience and you know just how to relate with other people being away from their parents and stuff so some kids are really good some kids are really bad but you know it's just based on how they are influenced you know they 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 copy people right away very really fast so yeah. you know they people That's usually true. say you can tell what kind of parents are by how the kid behaves yeah and then when you meet the parents you're like oh yeah, oh so this is this is bobby's parents like hey bobby this is your mom and dad what's up you know yeah <laughs> for sure yeah hope i have good kids yeah, yeah but, but don't you think now like after you've had that experience like you you would when you have whenever you would have kids you'd be like yeah maybe i can i could do this now I mean, I, I I think I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I really want kids. Yeah. I mean, I'm single, so it's not gonna be like anytime soon. But like, yeah, yeah I do. I yeah, gotta get kids. the priorities first. Or <laughs> well, yeah. Cool. All right. So um, another question too, I wanted to ask you about is that you know, since you do primarily photography, what is your, what do you think now of, um, not necessarily digital photography, but like a lot of more easy accessible photography, such as like Instagram and. Mm-hmm. all this social integrated stuff like do you think that's mm-hmm. a good thing or like a bad thing now with people oh I, I think it's great yeah I mean yeah I really like how everyone's sharing photos like um, and there's a so many so many like I, th- I think that's great just to share your life I'm, I'm a big like social person yeah. and I do a lot of Facebook and Twitter and stuff and I like hearing about my friends lives and everything so I think it's a good thing um, I think some people are, are think that there's like a photography overload or it's just too many mm. too many images mm-hmm. um but i don't have a problem with that it's fine. yeah one thing i heard though is is that sometimes um for example when we when someone says hey i'm going to take your picture mm-hmm. and the people who are going to get their picture taken you know they have a specific way how they look into the camera mm-hmm. you know obviously like sometimes some girls in the states they do like the duck face or whatever yeah you sure. know but people kind of slightly put up a more self-conscious persona in front of the camera yeah and then there i i guess sometimes there's a bit of a concern that maybe um uh, when you f- uh photo- like uh, photograph children at a really young age they're always going to have that kind of persona in front of the camera oh, really? so they might not always feel completely genuine huh. so i don't know if this is true but i was like mm, that, that actually kind of makes sense in a way i never heard of that yeah yeah, I never heard of that. But I love photographing children because, well, at adoption age when they're like two, they mm-hmm. look before two, like they don't know what a camera is. So that's true. There's yeah. a f- few people that don't change in front of the camera. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's really interesting now. Like sometimes when you see like YouTube viral videos of like mm-hmm. these kids, you know, like um, they do something like insanely cute, and then they just become internet sensations. Yeah. And then they had start having their own channel and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you think about that all the photos being shared is that a good thing or? yeah i think it's a good thing uh, um i get you know i guess since house f- photos always started in the beginning was like people some people used to have that kind of real life superstition superstition of fear of that it's actually literally taking your soul away mm-hmm. ounce by ounce um maybe now it's not even that maybe it's just like showing more aspects of yourself Mm-hmm. You know, we're always trying to leave a little bit more of a personal legacy of, of a foundation of what we do, mm-hmm. because you know, um, I I remember when I was young, it was very hard to take pictures. You know, compared to now, like, but I do miss that kind of spontaneity of um, having a disposable like Kodak camera. Yeah, you know, the yellow ones. Yeah, and then you only have like twenty four pictures to take. Yeah, and you just like go around and you do with your friends and you're like, okay this is gonna be number two, one and you're just like okay guys take a picture and then, 
and then you take all those pictures and you go into like Walmart you're like okay I'm gonna put this in there yeah and then you're waiting for an hour if you're lucky or even maybe for like a day or so you yeah. come back and you have no idea what what it looks like you're just kind of waiting for like a whole day yeah and when you see you're like fuck this is pretty cool man you know here it's a little bit different now because it's just like instant you can kind of see things going on which is fine it's because um, it's just kind of amazing how that changed so fast oh, and sure. and I totally forgot about that experience too yeah you know like a lot of kids are never gonna have that experience of like having a disposable camera and yeah. kind of waiting for the expectations of what's gonna happen but now it's kind of we can definitely kind of fine-tune what we're seeing right and then we can kind of you know um, edit and kind of you know configure in the perfect image of something that we want to do and um, I think stuff with like um, Instagram for sure you know it kind of gives you the option to give a certain feeling that you know you always saw and that you can try to express more in your in your pictures so yeah yeah the disposable cameras were kind of our age our childhood right yeah um, I will miss those I have do they still make them I haven't seen them in oh time. yeah totally yeah if you go to like any type of supermarket around this area, they still have oh, really? just one just hanging over there. You can just pick All it right. up. Nice. Yeah, I think I'll have those at my wedding. You know, I put them, put one on each table, and then let the guests. Yeah, that would be an awesome them. idea. Yeah. yeah, there's also really cool apps these days. Like, um, uh, they aggregate. So they say with this app at this wedding at this event, you know, take pictures, and then all those photos will automatically be uploaded to um, to a certain website. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they they have kind of a uh, digital version of that idea of putting a digital camera on each table. You, you know what I mean? So Oh, really? So. Yeah. So you take pictures with this app in your phone, mm -hmm. and then if you take it in that app, then it goes directly to the website. So all the pictures from that wedding or that event are, are in one place. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Let me, but, you know, with Instagram, I, I, don't, I really don't like the Instagram look. I feel like it's so gimmicky. It's but so gimmicky. everyone uses it. Yeah, it's like... Gimmicky how? <laughs> I don't know. They, everyone uses the same faded, faded but saturated, or like mm -hmm. so that, that same look to make your photos look pretty. But I don't. It's just my preference. I don't like that look. So that is it. Just that people are not doing it right. I don't know. They're doing it. They're doing it right. They're doing it like <laughs> how Instagram, you know, wants them to do it with that. Just you know, one button make the picture look pretty. But mm -hmm. I feel like because so many people use it, it's just uh, and it's not. I'm not very creative. I don't think. So, uh, I mean, uh, you know, now that you're, you you get into <coughs> photography, you must see it much more on a deeper level than other people, you know what I mean? Because you, you've experienced it more. It's kind of like, for example, if I'm drawing, I, I can kind of see it much more on a deeper level. Like I can, for example, I can understand the importance of a line. Right. You know, like a line is like what makes everything in a drawing and stuff. And each line represents like a, a certain thought, you know, that you're going through. And yeah. then when you finish the drawing, it's it's a collection of all these thoughts that you had you know represented as lines so for yourself like with photography like do you what is uh, some specific specific you know sp specific particular insights that you have about oh that's a I mean I could answer that question for like an hour you know you can, that's like, fine you can, you can write books you on that question um, it, yeah this improving the transcript photography for the book. has yeah. been a 10 year journey you know it's been yeah it's been a long journey to try to challenge myself and I, I've been so frustrated with photography because you know I look at where I want to be I look at artists that I like and I'm like mm -hmm. I'm not there and I look at my work and I'm like this sucks right <laughs> it's a constant that you do you do is you shoot an event and then you look at your photos you're like I suck I'm never shooting again but then you go out again and, and you shoot um, so it's been a difficult journey you know improving I think that's any artist's work right they, yeah, uh, yeah it's a reinvention constant reinvention mm -hmm. and uh, um, I don't know. There's a couple things like photography tricks or rules, composition rules. Mm -hmm. um, always think of your foreground and your background. You know, you always get sometimes you get stuck on a subject, mm -hmm. but then like the rest of the photo is really boring. You know, mm -hmm. so you always want to think of your subject and then think of what's in the background, mm -hmm. or if you're a background, what's in the foreground. You know, what I mean, mm -hmm. I think about both those things. So, like, what what are some things that people tend to miss out on? You know, when they're just doing, f f you know, photography. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a, a person that's an amateur, you know, compare like this is, I guess, for yourself, like you've you've done so many things, you have so much experience that you can tell when something's working, not and what's not working. Like, sure. what are some like um, things that people usually do that's a no-no, for example? Yeah, I, I think the easiest, the most, one of the first 
rules of photography that you learn. It's not a rule, but it's mm -hmm. a composition trick mm -hmm. or a general, usually follow the rule of thirds, mm -hmm. are you aware? Yeah. Yeah, so instead of putting the subject right in the middle of the frame, you move it to the side so it's on a one third line. Just so it makes some better composition. Yeah, 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 which is more pleasing. Or if, if it's a if it's a person that's looking or an animal or whatever that has eyes, mm -hmm. you don't want to put that. If the person's looking to the left, you don't want to put it on the left side of the frame, right? Or else they're looking into the edge of the frame. But you want to mm -hmm. put it on the on the right side of the frame so they're looking into the picture. Ah, yeah, yeah. That's that's interesting. I remember I had a friend of mine. He used to do tattoos, or he still does tattooing and stuff in Canada. And uh, there was one part where. He was explaining where whenever you draw um, a huge uh, tattoo piece on their back, he, he, had a, he had to do like a one picture on the left side of the, of the guy's back of a, of a tiger. And whatever image that you do, you never have the image going out of the back. It has to go into the back. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's like that's the composition of like a of a tattoo. Yeah, you know? it's yeah, like same like, thing. It's just like that's just the composition of a lot of things that you do as well, right? Because yeah. they're all kind of interconnected, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like uh, I guess even before cameras, you know, people, you know, used to just have that kind of uh, frame box, and they used to make like uh, individual grids. So when they look at a piece, they can kind of figure out what is the composition and just draw that out. So yeah, okay. yeah I guess it's all associated that way, right? Hmm. Okay. So uh, now, th now these days, how about you know? Why don't we check out your your site? Sure, if that's okay. Sure, I know sure. this is kind of the um, not the uh, it's, it's kind of more through the mobile version, but um, maybe if we can go through some of these adoption pictures and just explain what happened and what was it like and stuff. Sure. Okay. Give me a sec here. Okay. Hello, hello. Okay. So, yeah, so we're just checking out your site now. So, w is there anyone that you want to check out specifically that you want to um, talk about? Yeah, you can go just go to the top one. Connor? Yeah. Great. I just shot this couple like a couple weeks ago. Oh, yeah, it looks great. <laughs> 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 yeah, so what's going on over here? Uh, this family. Oh, sorry, sorry. We should move this off. Oh, does it, does it show? All right, it's full frame. Yeah. Okay. Well, this family, um, usually they meet the son in the room um, mm -hmm. with the social worker there, and it's more formalized, but this couple ran into their son in the in the lobby. Oh, wow. And so, uh, it was, you know, it's very, very emotional time when the very first time they meet their son, mm -hmm. and then this guy was a little bit shy, so he's hiding behind his foster mom. And, yeah, he got in there, and so I caught, caught that moment. It was really nice, because they're on their knees, and mm -hmm. he's hiding. So with the foster mom, I mean, is that is this transitioning to the the new adopted parents? Like, cause she's been taking care of this kid mm -hmm. for the whole time and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's very difficult for the foster parents. Yeah, because it's like letting go so easily. Yeah. It's not even easy at all. You know? Right. Yeah, it's, it's mm. very difficult. Okay, and then what was going? Where was this? This was um, at the. It was right outside the the room where they're supposed to have their meeting. Yeah, so I always try to tell a story with my adoption posts, you know, the first meeting and then going into the room, stuff like that. And um, the social workers back there, they're always, like, in love with the kids, so they're mm -hmm. always infatuated with them. And I really like their look because uh, they're really excited. Even though they do this, like, three times a day, <laughs> they still get excited for every kid that walks in. Yeah, it's always a different type of uh, experience. Like, it's always building that so much anticipation, like you said. Right? Yeah. So uh, it must be like um, intensively um, emotional every time. It was for me. It was the first time. I was like, I was all crying. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now I've I've gotten more used to it. Yeah. And then what's going on over here? So it's just a continuation of the story. So the kid mm -hmm. walks in, and I stuck the camera over their the mom's shoulder, and I got a picture of. Uh, mm -hmm. All their facial expressions. So usually, when uh, they're doing the ad adop uh, adoption process, um, do oh, what's happening here? Do they um, uh, how uh, how much are, are the foster parents allowed to know about um, the children's history? 
and are they allowed to explain this to their kid as well like yeah that for like 30 minutes in this room mm-hmm. they usually the adopting parents the international parents they bring a list of questions and then they ask the foster parents about about the kid mm-hmm. so like what time does he sleep how many times does he go to the bathroom every day mm-hmm. um, what are his likes and dislikes like they go through the whole list of questions trying to get to know their son mm-hmm. or their child but in terms of like their own personal history you know for example um are they allowed to know what happened to that to that child's specific parents or anything or is this like oh. it's always different in, oh. in the case i you know what i'm not sure i'm not sure how much they're allowed to know about that because i always wondered if it was like a very um private thing or is it something that they're even allowed to know about and uh because usually like when when the child grows up you know they're probably gonna have a lot of questions and stuff and uh, yeah they do have i know that this adoption agency holds international i know that they do have a program where kids can come back and uh, find their their real parents mm-hmm. so they do have all that information and mm-hmm. it's available um I, th- I think the parents do know that stuff because they obviously they, t- they tell the kid later on so have you ever done anything like that too or um with um adopted parent or adopted children look out to find their real parents or anything yeah actually i work with um a friend of mine who i work with do you know the website soul eats soul uh, eats yeah yeah soul eats, soul eats. I daniel work, gray yeah daniel gray mm-hmm. he's a friend of mine and we work on soul eats together and um he is adopted mm-hmm. and he came back to korea and met his real parents um, who live out in the country mm-hmm. so yeah mm, very cool uh, yeah, there should be more photos. But, uh, <laughs> I, don't know why it's not uh, I don't know. I apologize for that. Uh, let's let's just check out the another one here. Yeah, you want to check out? Um, actually, go to older posts. Okay, we're going to go to older posts. There was a shoot I liked a couple weeks back. No. Oh man, no, it's not. That's not it. Can you go yeah. back? Sure. Same thing. Oh, that's weird. Um, Let me try it out. Yeah. Oh, it's changed. There we go. Yeah, my website doesn't normally look like this. This is the... uh, mobile version Mm -hmm. Uh, so a lot of families they Mm -hmm. want those pictures inside that that room you know that first meeting Mm -hmm. but then a lot of them want pictures outside so we do family shoots Mm -hmm. like this they want to go often the temple is very nice because it's very iconic of korea absolutely and um so this family about a month ago we went to i think gyeongbokgu and uh, took some photos very cool and um, yeah the the um international the agency I think for the child's 100 day, they always give them hanbok, mm-hmm. or I think that's why they get the hanbok. Well, for whatever reason, every kid comes with a hanbok, and so mm. they dress up their kids in hanbok. It's really cute. Wow. Yeah. And and uh, these parents as well, like they they're permanently living in in Korea as well, or do they ever go back to the states? No, no, they just come to Korea for a week to pick up the kid and then go back. Oh wow. Yeah. So none of them live in Korea. Hmm. I see. And I mean, obviously, they they would have different reasons and you know motivations to do an ad- uh, an adoption, but mm-hmm. uh, what are some you know reasons why they they would do that for them? Um, probably the most common one, well, I don't know, but a big one is that a lot of people families can't have kids of their own, mm-hmm. and so they need to adopt to have a child. Uh, why they choose Korea, I don't I don't really know, but you know that's one reason. Uh, another reason is some of them. I think at least two of the parents were adopted adopted themselves, and so they want to um, kind of like pass on that gift that they, they received. Mm-hmm. And so, and then a lot of them are, a lot of them are Christians actually. Mm. And you know, the Bible is kind of a adoption story. You mm-hmm. know, God adopts uh, people, and so they want to they want to you know help other people and. And, uh, and I think that's, even if they're not Christian, that's a big, that's probably the biggest reason that they just want to help these kids that need families. Right, absolutely. 
Mm-hmm. That's a very cute picture. Yeah, that kid is so cute, man. <laughs> so, so it's just a great pose. <laughs> yeah. She, she just kept saying, he farted. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just like, yeah, yeah. I did. Yep. You know me. That's great. These kids, they got a lot. I heard that I keep in touch with some of these families. I keep oh, okay. in touch with this family, and right. uh, apparently these these kids get along really well. Wow, that's yeah. really great to hear. I know, right? Yeah, it's, it's awesome. So usually for like um, the, the uh, adoptee, like the the child who um, you know who's get has their new parents, like it must be kind of you must you must see a lot of different reactions, right? Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So like for them, because even for them, you know, they have a foster parent before mm-hmm. they meet them so i mean that's hard as well for them right like oh i don't, I don't think they know that their foster parents not the real parent yeah but i mean just like being together with that particular person you know yeah. during for how many amount of time like years months whatever yeah. and then going transition to someone and then maybe it might be like too late where they realize we're going on an airplane like, yeah what oh for sure and um like when they get into the taxi, they, they always take a taxi off out of the agency. The kid is always so confused. Oh my They're, god! They just yeah. have this look of like panic or confusion. Yeah. And it's really sad. And some of them don't cope well. And I heard that a lot of the kids, like, because they don't speak the same language, they barely speak like five words of Korean usually, because mm-hmm. um, they're only two or less, eighteen, nineteen months. Mm-hmm. And um, a lot of times when they're at the hotel, they. Or even when they go back to the States, I hear that the kids, like, take the parents to the door and, like, grab the shoes, like, saying, okay, it's time to go home, you know? Wow. And, um, oh, that's really intense. Yeah, so it's very difficult for the kids. Yeah. It, I mean, and, like, what do you do at that time as well, you know, when you're, like, uh, the parent that you, like, you, you, you've taken that kid, and then what do you say? Because, um, you know, like you said, even if they can't speak... Um, any English or Korean at all, mm-hmm. but they can understand what's happening and they're just trying yeah. to pull you out. And yeah. maybe for that whole time, they've just been listening to Korean, so they have s- at least some type of audible understanding of the language. And then, um, yeah, wow, <sighs> for sure, it's really tough on them. Cool, that's very interesting. But I heard that um, routine is very good for them, so it seems kind of mm. cool that they, the parents usually take the kids back really quickly and then go back to work, and um, and they would like to take time off, but then. It's much better for the kids to have a routine, to have the same thing happening every day. It helps them adjust. Mm, absolutely. So then, yeah, so I guess we, you said even with this family, you still keep in touch with them, but is there, uh, like, mm-hmm. a lot of other families that you s- keep in touch with as well and stuff? Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't keep in touch with them, like, very close, but mm-hmm. I'll, often the mothers, they always friend me on Facebook, so mm-hmm. I just get their, I get their updates. Cool, great to hear. Yeah. Okay. Is there any other, anything else that you want to check out together here? Um, I'll show you an example of um, sure. a kid that did not adjust so because it, it's it's always up to the kid to be like happy. I think I don't know how to photograph mm-hmm. children that are not happy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really tough for me because all of my images, even my engagement shoots and everything else, I just rely on people to be really happy, and I think that's my strongest point as a photographer is making people comfortable and. And smiling and stuff. Right. Uh, but then these kids, oh, this is great. It's not loading. <laughs> right. Never mind. So but what happens, I mean, if, if they're not comfortable, if they're not being happy with it, I mean, what can you do about that you know, as a photographer to capture the moment? Yeah. Um, give me one second. Um, with this family, I just tried to take them kind of far away <laughs> outside of to have the child. Because every time the mom would put the child down, she would just cry. And so mm-hmm. we couldn't get any pictures of her face um, or anything. Like, in the adoption room, she, she was okay because her foster mom was there. But when she when she was separated, like... This is her foster mom, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when they separated, she was just, just <sighs> upset, like, all day. So we had a family shoot the next day, and it was not what I was hoping it would be. But we still got some some good images. A lot of pictures of her back. <laughs> <laughs> And that, that mother was adopted herself. I see. And she came back to adopt her. It was really nice. Her father was a rocket scientist. What? <laughs> All right. That's amazing. Yeah. What are you, a rocket scientist? Actually, I am. Yeah. And how about him? He's a, he's a kid. He's the child of that family. So he's half Korean. Hmm. Also, which is funny. It's funny because that kid was only six, mm-hmm. but he looks 10. He's 
he's yeah. tall. He, yeah, he, he looks, looks, he looks, he looks old. older, actually. I would yeah. never assume he's six. Yeah, he's only six, though. This is funny, because it's like this kid who, he's super immature. You, you just think, why are you so immature? But then you're like, oh, you're six. But he's just <laughs> running around in circles, just like super goofy. And it was, it was really comical. Uh, wow. Comical guy. Yeah, scroll down a little bit more. Maybe the sure. photos are loading because we did a we did a family shoot. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, go down a little bit further. They obviously buy at the bus stop. It's tragic. Yeah, go down a little bit. Further. Mm-hmm. Yeah, here we go. So this day she was just nonstop crying. So you couldn't get any pictures of her smiling, but um, mm. she had to do a lot of. Uh, <laughs> that was actually not bad like yeah she wasn't crying i can, I can only imagine yeah oh man poor mom had to carry her like for like three hours straight but she was okay with her carrying her though I and mean, it was tough it was tougher she was physically just exhausted i guess you know it must be really interesting because you know it may it might make her think about what was she like when she was young and yeah you know like it was just like maybe i was probably the same or maybe it's really hard and uh and how old was was uh this this girl she was only like 20 months yeah they're all anywhere from 19 months to two years mm-hmm. a good one too yeah it was raining that day so we got the got some cool umbrellas so uh, so is there any th- anything else that you plan on doing with your photography now I mean now that you you were getting a lot of like like adoption you know e- um, meetings to do to take the f- photos but is there anything else that you want to do that that mm-hmm. you're planning on doing now yeah I would love to do um, oh, awareness work like I would love to do a project in North Korea uh, just to get the the lives of North Korean, mm. like regular North Korean people. Like, I'm tired of seeing the monuments and the political party, but I just want to get into the the homes of everyday North Koreans. Mm. So that's one project I would love to do one day. And how, how would you be able to get into that process and to go into Korea to take pictures of people? I mean, I have no idea. I have no idea. I mean, I'm pretty... I do I do some work with North Korean human rights groups. Yeah. So I'm just hoping one day I'll, I'll meet the right person who actually does some... Um, development work or something in North Korea, and I'll be able to get a ticket over. Mm-hmm. Is there is there anything else that you plan on that you would like to do if you go there in North Korea? Or not not just oh, sorry with the like your photography. Oh, photography. Yeah. Um, no, that's about it. I think just I, I love doing weddings. Like weddings are so much fun. It's just a huge party and everyone's happy and drunk and dancing and mm-hmm. and weddings are just a lot of fun and they pay well. So mm-hmm. I would love to do more weddings, but weddings are not good in Korea because foreigners don't get married here and Koreans do all their wedding photos in a studio beforehand right yeah they do it in a studio and well, it's, it's just boring I don't, I don't like that work they all look the same um, and then at the wedding ceremony you know you ever been to a Korean wedding yeah yeah absolutely. it's very short mm-hmm. and quick and it's no creative process for a wedding photographer so yeah it's it's kind of a bit of concern you know it's like mm-hmm. if uh, as a foreigner if you want to get married in korea it kind of feels like okay next 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 yeah. it's like a come and go kind of a thing yeah i mean you could always do it somewhere else like a church mm-hmm. you know, that's what i was mean so but you've 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 uh photographed like uh foreign marriages in korea um i did one i think mm-hmm. with my friends mm-hmm. but it's not something i'm really pursuing if i go back to the states i'll pursue wedding photography oh i see okay yeah, it's usually there that it's much more open and yeah more fun and stuff yeah yeah i see very cool wow so yeah those are some great photos man so um so what else have you been doing outside of photography now yeah i do um i just started a band um, nice yeah we've only been together for about a month and we're not that good <laughs> 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 but it's a lot of fun, you know. Uh, it's, uh, what's the name of the band? Uh, something on a Sunday. Something on a Sunday. Oh, yeah. really? So how did you guys get together? How does this uh, Me and my friend, I play guitar and sing, and my friend's a drummer, and we mm-hmm. used to play together in college. And oh, so he's in Korea as well. Yeah, yeah, wow. he's my best friend here. Wow, that's and awesome. Yeah, so he's he's a great drummer, and we <laughs> well, you know, we sometimes we go to the studio and we just play together, mm-hmm. and um, 
We're like, we should find some more people. So we hooked up with a couple guys on Craigslist and then got a full band. We're still looking for a, a keyboardist, actually, if you want to you join. I might, I might come out as a keyboardist. That'd be, yeah. that'd be awesome. Yeah. We'll, we'll do it. We'll set that up. Yeah, so we do it. We, you know, we just started gigging. We had two gigs this week. It was fun. And, where, uh, where did you go for the gig? Oh, just like these open mics in Etowah. You know, we need, we need uh, to... With Woodstock? Or? Woodstock, yeah, we did Woodstock on Thursday. With Albert, yeah? Yeah, you know Albert? Yeah, I go there for comedy and stuff. Oh, dude, that guy's that guy cool. Oh, yeah, he's a great guy. He's been... He came to the podcast a few times and stuff. Oh, right on. Yeah. He's, he's just a nice guy. Yeah, he's a really nice guy. Yeah. We, we also did a show at Tony's. Tony's. But Yeah, yeah, I know Tony's. You do come there, too. So, you go, what, Sundays or Mondays? Um, Tony's? Yeah. We went there on a, on a Monday, but I don't think we're going to play there again. We didn't, we didn't like it very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit small, but I I think uh, with the Thursdays at Woodstock, it's a little bit more open. There's you know more performances rather yeah. than uh, they have a nicer stage. Like, they need they need some new equipment though, man. Oh, I know, because like, with the mic, it's like <laughs> yeah, like it's, in the floor when you go into the stage, it's almost like it's gonna cave in or something. Yeah, man. yeah. There's no there's no reverb. There's no effects. There's, like they need a lot of stuff. You gotta bring all your stuff for you for yourself or for family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, but the people there are really nice and uh, absolutely had a good time. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, what kind of music uh, are you into then? Uh, we're just playing covers of. Mm-hmm. Um, are you gonna be like a tribute band, like a Kiss tribute band? Uh, I would love to be a Switchfoot tri- tribute band. Cause Switchfoot. That's, that's okay. like my favorite favorite band. But we just play, okay. you know, whatever the band members want to play. Like we play Santeria and some Sublime and cool. um, Switchfoot and. Some other stuff, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, I guess uh, we gotta get you guys to come here one day and uh, do okay. like a, a live performance here. I think that'd be great. All right, I think that's what we need. We need some more live performances and stuff. You, you play as long, man. Uh, not, no, not right now. <laughs> <laughs> next time, uh, next time I'll, I'll perform. I don't think nobody really knows that I do music here, so yeah, it's one of those things. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting because like the community is really small here and stuff. Mm-hmm. So then you can always find oh, you, you know, you're doing. You know, music or photography or comedy or blah mm-hmm. blah blah blah, and then yeah. it's really interesting how people get together that way. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, on top of music, that was just recent. I do some work with um, North Korean human rights, just with Justice for North Korea. Mm-hmm. They're a really cool group. We're putting on a fundraiser next month. Mm-hmm. Um, what else do I do? That's about it. Yeah. Okay, so for yourself, I mean, you're half Korean, right? Yeah. So that same thing with me. Uh, what is how do you view your I, your personal identity with mm-hmm. Korea, and you know with your other half, you know? Yeah, at home. Um, I, I've always viewed myself as Korean American because mm-hmm. I grew up with all Korean American friends, mm-hmm. and um, I grew up in a Korean church, so I was very all my best friends even now are all Korean Americans. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know why. It's not that I'm I don't think I'm racist or anything. It's just that that's <laughs> the ten people that I tend to gravitate towards. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that's my identity. And Korean Americans are very different from uh, Koreans. You mm-hmm. know, it's a totally... They're not even accepted here, you know. Um, why Why is that? It's because of the language? Yeah, it's language. And Koreans tend to not... They don't see Korean Americans as Koreans, right? Because you have to go mm-hmm. through the whole school system, military service. Like, all these things build up this mm-hmm. national identity where if you don't grow up here, like, you're not, you're not one of us. I mm-hmm. think so. I think a lot of Korean Americans have a ho- difficult time um, adapting here because it's very different from America. It's very homogenous, and there's so many social rules that if you don't follow, then you know you're viewed as different. Um, but my ident- yeah, so my identity is Korean American, and um, I've always enjoyed being half. Actually, I kind of pretend like I'm Korean when I need to pretend like I'm not when I <laughs> when yeah. the situation calls for it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then you definitely have that kind of um, dual perspective on, on all things as well, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I guess some parts you can appreciate, appreciate you know, the, the Korean side of things here and, and then sometimes the, the foreign side as well. Right. Yeah. Sure. Hmm, okay, so uh, now are you, do you plan on indefinitely staying in Korea now or do you have any plans to ever go back home to San Diego? Or? I plan on staying in Korea until I'm fluent in Korean. That's That's been my... Um, goal since I came here, hmm. which is sad because my Korean is still not close to being fluent, but I'm actually I'm going back to school starting in January, mm-hmm. so my photography is, you know, only I only have to be at a certain place a couple hours a week, mm-hmm. so it's very flexible, and so I'm going back to Yonsei, mm. uh, Korean school, begin that in January, 
Um, you can do that for a year, and then if you're on the split, I'll probably head back to the states. Mm-hmm. So I guess it's just about um, you know understanding more about the language to like fully express yourself in Korean and stuff. Yeah, I want. I mean, eventually, I want to work and um, do do work in North Korea. That's my end goal, and to get there, I really need to be able to speak Korean. Mm-hmm. And it's always been my life goal to speak Korean fluently. So. Absolutely. Uh, so do you, does your parent, does your mom or your parents, do they talk to you in Korean at all or anything? Or? Um, my mom's English is perfect because I think she went to a nas- international school when she was growing up. Mm-hmm. So she never spoke to me in Korean when I was growing up. Not even when she was mad at you? Oh, yeah. I mean, come yeah. on. Yeah. <laughs> it's a given, right? <laughs> you know, funnily, she, my, all my cousins have nicknames. Yeah. Like, I don't know. They have their real name. Like, um, like for example, my cousin's name is Jungsik. But then they always call me like Dobyeol. I don't know why they have these, you know, multiple names for mm-hmm. my cousins. But my mom would always call me Donke, and and she'd be like, Yeah, Donke, yeah, Donke. And then I thought that was my second name. But you know, what Donke means. Well, can you explain to everyone? Yeah, else? it's like the those like shabby crap dogs on the street. It literally translates to like shit dog, Donke. Yeah. And so, okay. uh, you like Duncan? <laughs> You're like my name's Duncan. My middle name is Duncan. No, yeah, it is Donke. She's like Donke. Yeah. Well, why did she call you Donkey for? Because uh, I'm mixed breed. <laughs> <laughs> Your mom called you Donkey. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I was small. Okay, my my full name is uh, Wilfred, but um, I remember when I was small, uh, my grand my harboji he used to always say like, "What's your name?" I'd be like, "Wilfred." What? Wolf, 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 wolf. <laughs> and then and it's like you can't pronounce it it's like okay we're calling him Steven so they call me Steven so my middle name became Steven but they call me Steven they, they don't need like no one everyone else views me as Wilfred my parents my brother all my friends but they're the only people that always call me Steven why don't they just call you Will it's so hard to, pr- to pronounce it will, sounds like will. sounds like will, 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 will. Yeah, yeah. it's like Steven 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 sounds more easier to say. That's awesome. Yeah. So I guess there's only one Wilfred right now in Korea. <laughs> yeah, I think so. That, that name is quite rare, actually. Oh, you know what? You know what I really wanted to do? I saw this uh, great prank. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you if you heard this before, but there was like a Facebook prank that you can do. It's like, um, your name's Dustin Cole, right? Mm-hmm. Have you ever checked for other Dustin Coles in on oh, Facebook sure. and stuff mm-hmm. like that? I, I had this experience where this one other guy, his name was uh, um, uh, Wilfred. <clears throat> and uh, he basically what he did was, um, so, yeah, uh, he, people who um, have the same name as him, he tries to add them. Mm-hmm. But he he takes their he takes their picture uh-huh. and he he needs copies he remakes oh, yeah. the same picture. I saw as that him. recently. It was on yeah. Reddit, right? Yeah, it was definitely on Reddit. Yeah. So we I want to show some people here and stuff. Yeah, that was hilarious. Yeah, let's see if we can show some people. I think that's one of my goals. <laughs> you should do that. Give people like a a huge mind fuck and just like who is this guy, man? Who is this guy? Okay, let's see here. just not working hmm guess not well I guess next time then <laughs> oh well yeah so <clears throat> you know you, you mentioned you know about your, your goal about going to North Korea what is your fascination with North Korea um, I just think it's it's the worst place in the world right now. Uh, We're in the worst place in the world, and wh- for what reasons and why? Um, politically, and uh, I think you know, like e- economically, it's it's just the most backward country on earth right now. And the leader, everything's so, you know, you you have to think a certain way, you have to do s- certain things, and if you don't, like, like if you mess up, they throw your whole family, three generations, in prison. You know, labor camps for life. Mm-hmm. That's just that's crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, did you? Oh, recently. Oh, there's a interview. Do you know Shin Dong Hyuk? No, by any chance. He was the first person that escaped from. That was born in a, a prison camp in North Korea. Ah, oh, right, right, right. And it escaped. Right? Mm-hmm. And then they wrote a book about him called um, "Escape from Camp 14." Okay. Yeah. Have you heard of that book? Um, no. 
it's pretty um pretty famous it just came out a couple months ago it was really great it's a well-written book it gives a really updated view of north korean society and and the um prison camp system mm -hmm. um anyway he is being interviewed and is showing on cbs with anderson cooper um tomorrow oh wow yeah so that's gonna be re really really good it's, his story is incredible because he grew up in a prison labor camp and um he had no idea that there was even an outside world and um, that's like the village yeah yeah <laughs> it's scary it's creepy like he oh my God. finally met someone someone got put in the camp that was like uh, raised outside of the camp, and so he got to know about the outside world. And then one day he escaped. Um, it's a fascinating story. What would happen if you were living in one place and you thought you were like the only country in the world, and then afterwards someone's like, "Dude, no, you just yeah. you're, you're not even oh, you're not in the, the entire country itself. You're divided." You yeah, know? it's like the Truman Show. It's crazy. But isn't that weird though? Because I mean, they've he must be old enough to kind of have some. Um, knowledge or, or understand about the division between north and south right because well i mean in the camp there's like there must be a lot of propaganda against americas and yeah you know, of course yeah, it's like absolutely. but he must know about that though or something right i don't well if you're brought up in that camp where there's no oh, outside so. information right like, you know he had no idea that there was even a world outside of it he just thought everyone lived like this people, some wow. people are guards some people are prisoners yeah that's crazy jesus christ Yee, that's freaky. <laughs> oh, do you ever do you ever watch Vice? Uh -uh. You know Vice. It's no. like a, it's this one. Uh, they they do a lot of documentaries, and they did one documentary in Russia near the tri Trans Siberian uh, Railroad Trail, mm -hmm. and there was one logging uh, area mm -hmm. where North Korea owns that area, mm -hmm. and what they do is they transport all the North Koreans to work in that area, and they build up a little small village. That some of them actually are convinced it's North Korea, mm -hmm. and they have no idea. Oh, wow. And then um, uh, during the time when Kim Jong Il was still alive, he made a deal with, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin and, and all the uh, political regimes to um, bring, you know, all those uh, not I guess they're not really ref refugees, but just all those labor camp workers to go there and then work mm -hmm. in that area. Mm -hmm. And then. Uh, the vice crew they went over there they went to go check out this place and start talking with them and stuff and they had no idea basically what what you know the guy that you mentioned as well no idea about what was happening and stuff and that's crazy they were so scared because like if someone catches them talking to them you know mm -hmm. they're gonna get in so much shit yeah they're gonna kill your family yeah it's, it's crazy oh man have you ever seen that kind of situation where sometimes where people they would get the balloons and put like um anti I guess anti-propaganda material and yeah. just try to send it over to the yeah. north and stuff. North Koreans these days, they are typically aware of the outside world because there's no way to stop radio broadcasts. You know, Seoul broadcast radio um, across the border and then people send leaflets. And actually with those balloons, uh, my, my friend is in charge of that agency that runs that, um, oh, that wow. program. Mm -hmm. They send over a lot of socks because um, apparently socks are very rare in North Korea. It's mm -hmm. very cold. It's, uh, it's tough getting through the winter with no socks. Um, yeah, but I think North Koreans are pretty aware, but there's nothing they can do about it because the military is so strong, and, mm -hmm. and if you step out of line at all, they throw your entire extended family, you know, in these prison camps. You know, sometimes it's just one year or two years, but sometimes it's, you know, for life. So. Uh, one or two years is up, it's, it's, it's a long time, too, you never know. Crazy. <laughs> so, oh, man, what, just, um... What do you think on your on your own opinion? Like, what do you think would ever happen if North and South were ever reunited? Like, um, what what do you think? How can you see that happening? What what do you think that life would be like? I mean, that that'd be great. I think South Koreans are not looking forward to it because it'll be so costly economically. That is like their main reason why they don't want it to happen, right? Yeah. They're more well, maybe not want to happen, but just kind of apprehensive about it, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I think the majority of South Koreans I talk to like don't want it to happen, which I think is tragic. I, mm -hmm. I think it's really sad. Um, but I'm sure it would be very difficult on all sides because mm -hmm. North Koreans will be like, "Why didn't you guys help us?" <laughs> or South Koreans, yes, yeah, it'll be a very difficult transition. It'll be like a lot of disdain and yeah, and there's a lot anxiety. of. And the cultures after 60 70 years cultures have changed too so yeah so that's one thing i've been kind of thinking about if that ever did happen how much of 
North American culture would spread out to South and vice versa. Because mm-hmm. um, it might feel like, um, for us, it might feel like, okay, definitely, you know, the South, Amer- South Korean influence would take over the rest of North Korea, and then they would just adapt to the lifestyle here. Mm-hmm. But maybe there might be a lot of people who, who are very kind of resistant to it yeah. as well, because they want mm-hmm. to still maintain their own personal, ironically, Korean heritage, Yeah, you know, away from the South Korean one. I never thought about that way. That would be quite interesting. Yeah, because um, as 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 long as much as that people want to be free, I, I think it might be kind of hard for them to kind of get a job that they really want to do it in the beginning, right? They would maybe have to get jobs that they don't want to do or something. Yeah. Yeah, true. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe December twenty second, two thousand twelve. <laughs> Mayans, <laughs> what's going on? Did you see that new meme with? Uh, Nostradamus, he made a prediction with... Uh, uh, yeah, I think I saw it. Yeah, yeah with um, Psy. <laughs> yeah. Something about... Um, what was it? I don't know. It was on Reddit, right? Yeah, everything's on Reddit everything's these days. Reddit. Yeah. yeah I'm a Reddit like, stalker. <laughs> Reddit sure, stalker. Seems like yours, too. <laughs> yeah, just Reddit. Anyways, uh, yeah, I guess that's all the time we have. We've been talking for like an hour. An nice. hour. Yeah, it's been pretty good. So is there anything else that we can let people know about uh, your site or anything that's coming up? And um, Check out my website, DustinColePhotos.com. Okay. Um, there's a fund- North Korean fundraiser, December 15th, uh, 7 p.m. at Dillinger's Bar in Yukon. Cool. Um, get to know more about North Korean issues. Mm-hmm. And come out have some drinks. I'm performing. I'm playing some music. You're playing at the Dillinger's? Yeah. I'm also doing a photo booth. Um, oh wow! Yeah, it's gonna be cool. Like, I don't know. If, there's a awesome couple that does a wedding photography called The Images Found. Yeah. Um, check out theimagesfound.com. They're amazing. They're like my dream photographers, mm-hmm. and they always do photo booths at their at their weddings. It's like super goofy photos, happy. Um, and so I'm gonna just copy them and do the same thing <laughs> at, at, at Dillinger's that day. So come have your photos taken. Very cool. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Okay, so Dillinger's at December 15th? December 15th, yeah, 7 p.m. With a performance by? By myself, and there's about five performers, so I'm not going to be playing for very long. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to checking that out, at least. Yeah, right. Okay, so thanks to you so much. I really appreciate it. Sure, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, For everyone else out there, just remember to tune in to Artist Journey. We usually do one every Sunday. If not, we might have some coming up this week. We're going to have a lot of interesting... um, uh, other people that, that are going to be coming out next week as well. Uh, d- don't forget to like our page on Facebook, facebook.com backslash my artist journey. Just like, and then you can get a lot of inspirational posts and blah, 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 blah. Also, we are working on a site, artistjourney.org. It's not completely finished yet, but we've set up a Tumblr, so you can follow us on Tumblr and just get some cool pictures and whatnot. And that is all from us f- for today. I hope you guys have a great night. And a Sunday, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.